live from New York, it's Ask an Engineer. Hey everybody, welcome to Ask an Engineer. It's me, Lady Ada, as always, with me, Mr. Lady Ada. We're here at the Ada Food Factory in downtown Manhattan. This is not fake. This is real. We are in the factory again. Not a you, simulation. Not a simulation. Well, Yet. maybe. We don't know that. Uh, you can see, hear the alarms because we're, we're sirens because Siren. it's New York City. Yeah. Uh, this is the factory where we manufacture all the goodies you love from Adafruit. All the electronics are designed and fabricated and kitted and tested and documented and shipped out of here. Uh, right now, the factory is resting. Everyone's home, and that's why we're maskless in, indoors. Yeah. Uh, Phil and I are fully vaxxed, and we live together. Um, yep. Somehow we, we pretty soon we won't we have stand each we other. won't have to have the disclaimer. I know it's a weird disclaimer. Um, but, I remember uh, you know last year we had to tell everyone they're like why are, why are they so close next to each other? I know we and it was like in our apartment with yeah, like, like, the laundry no, hanging we, out. We, we <laughs> live together. So. We live together. Anyway, we're not home right yeah. now. We're at the office. Uh, nobody else here. But uh, it's just us and you, and uh, we have about an hour's worth of news and updates and videos and projects and tutorials, and it's not out yet. And all the other whatever good stuff. Yeah that is coming your way from Adafruit. Uh, this is our hour to, to set you up with everything that's happened in the last week. That's right. So let's get right into it. We even have a code. Yeah, we brought back the We're code. Bring it back. So in... Uh, you gotta get that phone. Yeah, too. in, in uh, celebration we'll of lots of rainbows, talk about that throughout the show. And Radiohead. Um, and I did listen to some Radiohead today. The yep. code is in rainbows. 10% off in the Adafruit store all the way up until I remember to turn the code off tonight. So at least one hour from now. That'll at least be one hour from now, probably till 10 p.m. Eastern time. So start putting stuff in your cart in rainbows. Thank you for supporting a 100% woman-owned open source hardware company here in New York City. Um, we're going to talk about some of our live shows, including show and tell, a little bit of a recap. Not all of them, because we have a lot every single week. So now we're just telling you to watch them over on YouTube. Some time travel, look around the world, makers, hackers, artists, engineers, current events, and more. Help Wanted, we got a job from the Adafruit Jobs Board. You can also visit it, jobs.adafruit.com, post your skills, or if you're a company and you want to hire cool people, post over there. We've got some made New York City factory footage. We've got some 3D printing. We got DigiKey and Adafruit present Ion MPI. Got some new products. We got some top secret. We're gonna answer your questions, but we do that where? Oh yeah, Discord. Discord. Adafruit.it slash Discord, where you can join all 29,000 of us. All that and more on, you guessed it, Ask an Engineer. Yay! So let's first um, just, you know, pay the bills in rainbows. That's the code. And uh, lots of reasons off. for that. 10% all the way up till 11.59 p.m. probably tonight. Um, if you're on the store and you want to get free stuff, all you have to do is start adding stuff to your cart. Yes. Later, what do they get? When you get buy from Adafruit, $99 or more, you get a free Permaproto half-size breadboard. Great for taking your projects, making them permanent. So, uh, if you spend 149 or more you get a free sensor with stem and qt connectors we also have a cutie pies in there and some other boards uh we mix them up and you'll get a different one each time if you make an account so we can track which ones we sent you 199 or more you get free ups ground shipping in the content of the united states and 299 or more you get a circuit playground express Ex express express our all-in-one development board no solder required lots of leds buttons sensors piezos, accelerometer switches, so you can get started in code.org, CS Discoveries, CircuitPython, Arduino, um, TinyGo, Tiny Go, Rust, Lisp, you name Rust it. whatever. It's all supported yeah. uh, in the Circuit Playground Express. It's our favorite board, so our giveaway. All right, um, we have our live shows. Uh, we just finished up Show and Tell. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff. Like I mentioned Check before, um, the show and tells are jam packed now, and so it's at the point where you should watch it on any of our video. It's properties. got cyberpunks. We've got Hadokens. We've got yeah. gigantic keycaps. You can also see some of the progress um, on some, some of the projects that our team's doing, and Broad then bands. the entire community yeah. as well. So do check that out. We should use Word Cloud. On Sunday, um, we do Desk of Lady Ada, and then this week. Um, we showed a few things. Okay, what did I show? Oh, first off, uh, yeah, I made, I played around with making keycap molds uh, using a, a UV nail lamp, and I was pretty successful. And so I showed off some of the keycaps I made. Um, I also showed off some samples we got for um, GH60 60% keyboards. I want to make a Circuit Python keyboard, so I wanted to find one that I could get a case for. And the GH60 cases are plentiful. I can get aluminum ones and plastic ones. So now that I have a case, as I've always said, this is like one of the first things I told Phil when we met. You get the case first, and then you design the electronics for the enclosure. Yeah. Is that true? And then uh, we did the great search, and that's where Lady Ada uses all her powers of engineering for good. And uh, she goes to the DigiKey site, and she finds stuff that you probably need. Yes, this week was diodes, because I was looking at these keyboards, and they all have matrices, key matrices that have diode protection, so that you can avoid key key ghosting when you press multiple keys. 
And so it's like, well, I should show people, you know, especially if you're making keyboards, it's one of the few components that you need to buy. So how do you find 1N4148 diodes in the glass bead type or in surface mount type? These are the two ones that I found most common in, uh, micro, sorry, in macro keypad and programmable mechanical keyboard kits. Okay. Right. And then um, every Tuesday we do JP's product pick. And um, still to this day, I think it's the only live electronics show that broadcasts from a product from page. So we do, the page. we do it from within the page and you don't and have you to- And you get mega discounts. Yeah, and you don't have to put in a code because it's just for that product. So Instant. let's do a little bit of recap from this week's. It is the Neo Key 2 Featherwing, and it is a Featherwing for adding two mechanical key switches to a Feather project, and it has underlit NeoPixels. I've got this Feather, this is the RP2040. Then I have a Feather OLED. What you'll see here is when I press these, I am triggering a different illustration over here of this little bongo cat. This works as kind of a neat little macro key camera switcher right there. Uh, and I get my little bongo cat to ping, 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 ping. That is my product pick of the week. It is the Neo Key 2 Featherwing. It is a mechanical key switch Featherwing with underlit NeoPixels. So tomorrow you can tune into JSP, JP's workshop for the next one. And then part of JP's workshop is the CircuitPython Parsec. And here's a highlight from the latest one. You can also watch it live tomorrow, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern time, JP's workshop. For the Circuit Python Parsec today, what I want to do is talk about pulse width modulation. So pulse width modulation is a way of faking an analog output where rather than smoothly sweeping through voltages, we make very fast little sort of steps that look analog to the eye, but the way they work is that we're essentially flicking a light switch on and off real fast. So the full on and full off, if we change the amount of time between those square steps, then we can average out to different voltages. So you can see here in my code, what I have is I'm importing time uh, so we can pause, importing board so we get pin definitions, and I'm importing the PWMIO library. Then I'm setting up this pin on uh, the, the LED pin, which is a PWMIO output on one of the board's pins, and then we're setting a frequency as well as a duty cycle. Uh, then we set the duty cycle to a particular value when it starts up, which is about half, which would approximate a one and a half volt uh, being sent to this LED and the uh, resistor that's there to protect the LED from over, over current. Then in my main loop, all we're doing is stepping through, increasing and decreasing the spacing between these full on off square waves, which as those go in and out of speed between them, we get this approximation of a smooth voltage. So you can see here in uh, the case of this little cutie pie, I've got uh, a big fat LED on there and it looks like it is nice softly gently changing its values like you'd expect an analog output to do, except I'm not plugged into an analog output at all. I'm just using one of the regular digital pins and essentially triggering it on off real fast. And so that is how you can use PWM in CircuitPython and that is your CircuitPython Parsec. But I oh. want more. I want more Circuit Python. Well, if you want more Circuit Python, don't forget to tune in to Deep Dive with Scott. That's this Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 we Pacific. Didn't die. And then after that, two week break, and then Scott will be back. So if you want to learn about all the things that go into Circuit Python and more, tune in on Friday. Next up, time travel. Look around world makers, hackers, artists, engineers, events, and more. So first up, Happy Pride Month, everybody. Happy Pride Month. So, Dude, New York City is going to be just like, it's banging already. Everyone right. is out. Everyone is so, vaccinated. Everyone's having a great time. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to mention is for the last decade or so, um, we've celebrated the community together from uh, changing a logo on our site to our team having uh, events 
to just all the things that we do to be the most inclusive company because we think that the more people you have with different backgrounds and different life experiences and just different parts of life, um, the better you get. It's also fun to be gay and do crimes. And so, or synthesizers, and so, or both. And so one of the things that we're noticing, though, is a lot of companies, you know, just for a couple days a year, um, they'll just put up a little rainbow, and, you know, the rest of the year they're donating to politicians that are trying to take rights away from people. So um, I guess I would just ask the community, make sure that you're, you're telling the companies that do the work and that are helping to keep it up because it'll never end. This, the work is always there and um, the, the fight continues. This is just the one month where we get to celebrate some yeah. of the fighting and, that has happened and, you know, all year round. You know, we have our, you know, we change our things on Discord and all of our social media platforms and you know, we want everyone to know that this is a cool, safe place that everyone is welcome to. But I also know, and Lady Ada knows, that there's a lot of like big company and corporations that they, they do this, I guess it'd be called like rainbow washing. Okay, can I talk about the chase? It wasn't Chase. Was it, it Citibank? It was. So we're in New York and in Union Square. It says all there's the, all the banks. All the banks are like super yeah. rainbowy, and it's like they're yeah. just taking your money. On, like yeah, yeah, they probably have like you know gay pride. Maybe they donate to causes. I hope, but it, it's like they're just there to take your money. Yeah. So you know they're when banks. when it when, when you you know see some of like hey look this like military contractor company now just changed a rainbow for the month. I I understand how folks. Say like, yeah, hey, pink, pink tanks that's are just pinks. like performative and everything. Yeah. But there are a lot of um, good companies and good people and good organizations that still to, and will always uh, fight to bring everyone together and have rights for all and equality. So um, throughout the month, we'll be celebrating folks on our blog. Check that out. And uh, our team thanks you for supporting a cool company that has everybody and everything. And that's why um, you know you'll see the rainbows all year round, but this year in particular. Um, more so than ever, it's important to celebrate and elevate each other. Next up, um, we did some demos with Microsoft, and uh, we have a, uh, I guess it was a behind the scenes, so it was the Loeb demo from the Microsoft keynote. Uh, Kevin Scott, the CTO, um, introduced Lemore. We had filmed something here in the factory, and even though you know it was edited and put together, we did the demo as one does, like you know, kind of in one take. And then when I got home, I said, oh, before I put all this stuff away, let me just show a video of it. So for the folks who didn't see that six minute long video, here's a less than one minute video on a project we did called Bakery that uses machine learning and AI and uh, ML on the edge and TensorFlow for microcontrollers and TensorFlow Lite to do all this stuff. So take it away past us. Okay, lady, what is this? Hey, I'm using Microsoft Lobe, which is an application running on this computer. Connect up to this webcam, and I'm using that to train different baked goods. So, for example, this is a cross bun, and then I can uh, move the bagel underneath the camera. I've already trained these up. I've taken lots of images, and so I can do basic machine learning, visual recognition of different objects. Um, cross bun. Okay, so this is bagel, a computer, and we trained it. We trained it on baked goods. Then that's what? right. And then I took the TensorFlow Lite file. I exported the TensorFlow Lite file from that computer, and I saved it onto this Raspberry Pi with a BrainCraft hat, and then. It's connected to a Raspberry Pi bagel. camera, and it's also detecting items like this bagel or this cross bun. Cross so it's, bun. it's a really easy way to uh, train machine learning models for TensorFlow Lite vision recognition, something that's normally really annoying to do. You do it very easy on the computer, and then you can deploy it to the edge on your Raspberry Pi with your Raincraft hat. OK, and then um, the other thing, want to talk about is there's changes for Adabox folks that are in the Europe and UK. I'll be sending out an email to our Europe and UK customers. So unless you were the two people who had gift subscriptions, your last Adabox was the most recent one we sent out. So you're not going to get charged for the next one. You're not going to get the next one. And we're not going to do anything with your email address or anything like that. Like We're not going to spam and, and you. If, and if we do or when we do allow European or UK orders, we'll, we'll notify get the word you. Out. We'll get we'll, the word out. We'll get the word out. Um, but I'm going to send. Not yeah, but I'm going to send the email. So the shipping costs change so much, and, and the we, vat and the weights collected, yeah. and 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 everything and it just went up. got really complicated. And everything went up. And what we didn't want to do is say, well, if you want to pay more, we can send it to you. And then here's a totally different price tier for Ada boxes. Especially in since we have distributors in Europe that take yeah. care of all this stuff for you. So it's like people aren't getting their stuff held up in customs. We don't have a good experience for people. Yeah. So I'll be sending out the notes to folks that are in Europe and the UK. And for the two folks that got gift 
subscriptions, we're just going to send them their, the remaining boxes because that's that's how we roll. All right. Um, oh, and if you are an Ada Box subscriber in Europe and you're not getting one anymore, I'll probably toss in a discount code just for being nice. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so get that. All right. Every single week, Monday through Friday, unless it's holiday, you can expect Colin's. Monday. Yeah, Monday was uh, holiday. Uh, Colin's lab notes. So take it away, Colin. These are all the things from Colin's desk and lab and more. And his brain. A lot of boards, like the Feather microcontroller here, feature 0.1 inch spaced solderable holes that make breadboarding easy. Solder header pins on, plug it in, and you've got a strong connection. If you want to attach accessories to your board, like this Feather wing, solder socket headers to the Feather instead, solder pins to the Feather wing, and attach. What's that? You want to plug a microcontroller into a breadboard and attach an accessory? Well, you're in luck because stacking headers are a thing. They're a combo of plug and socket headers, essentially socket headers with very long pins. Align them for soldering by plugging a matching daughter board into the sockets. Solder the base of each long pin to a pad. And now you're double stacking electronics. Nice. Many Adafruit boards, like these feathers, let you easily connect a rechargeable battery for portable projects. It's a helpful feature, just look for the two-pin socket, usually labeled LiPo or LiPoly. Of course, Adafruit also sells a LiPo battery with matching connector. It would be great if everyone followed the same standard. Unfortunately, there are vendors online that sell batteries that look very similar, but have the red and black wires swapped. For example, this one is correct with the red wire on the left when plugging it in. But this battery has power on the right and ground on the left. Reversing power and ground like that can damage the feather. So keep an eye out and mind your power connectors. Thank you. The shaft on a traditional pod can be rotated less than 300 degrees total, but a multi-turn potentiometer can make multiple full rotations. They're useful in high precision applications where you need to find a very specific resistance value. These are both 10 turn wire wound pots and a quick look inside will show us how they get their name. The resistive element is coiled or wound along the inside of the cylinder with each end connected to one of the pots exterior terminals. When the shaft is rotated, the attached wiper contact slides along the length of the coil, providing a varying resistance based on its position. It's basically the same mechanic as a regular pot, just extended, while maintaining a similarly sized footprint. Time for another teardown. This time, we'll take a look inside the can of a classic NRF51822 Bluetooth low energy module. Removal of the NRF51's RF shielding will come courtesy of the Quick 957 DW Plus Hot Air Rework Station. And we're in. Things are fairly simple in here, thanks to the NRF51822 chip containing an M0 processor, RAM, and flash memory, accompanied of course by its friend the timing crystal, and a traffic jam of passive components along the path out to the chip antenna. All right, and next up, if you like Atari 2600, you're gonna like this video from Phil B. The Atari 2600 was not the first home game console, but its popularity makes it a nostalgia magnet. The process by which it generated graphics was kind of amazing. Consider a CRT of the era, scanning top to bottom, left to right, about 60 times a second. Nearly anything that came later had a frame buffer. The image on the screen corresponds to a bitmap in RAM. But 1970s RAM was so expensive, the system only had 128 bytes of it. Not megs, not kilobytes, 128 bytes. So the CPU had to help generate the image one scan line at a time. Luxury! Yeah, it really only held half a scan line. 
Those 20 bits could either be duplicated or flipped. Clever programs got around this symmetry by changing that data right in the middle of the scan line. This was called racing the beam because you can't back up, there's no do-overs. If you ever want to try this punishment, there's an in-browser development emulator at 8bitworkshop.com. Okay, some more time travel. Um, for the folks who are following along, um, an interesting development in the electronic space. Siemens bought Supply Frame, and Supply Frame owns Hackaday and Tindy. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do is reach out to Siemens and say, hey, can I interview Siemens uh, and someone from Supply Frame, Hackaday, Tindy, because uh, this is interesting. And a little bit of a disclosure, I started Hackaday 17 years ago. Nothing to do with now, still my logo that I made, site mission is still spot on, and Supply Frame's done a good job of taking care of them. And uh, it is a trend in the industry right now as far as consolidation goes because I wanted to make sure as I was writing up the interview questions that hopefully they'll pass along to the management there and be able to talk about what they're going to do and not do with Hackaday, Supply Frame, Tindy. Um, but there's a whole bunch of companies that uh, if, if you don't live in this space, you don't know about the consolidation. Mm -hmm. And so that was, it was one of the questions I, I asked. Mm -hmm. um, but just to read these off really fast, Altium acquired Octopart, Upverter, and Cliva. Mauser, owned by TTI, which is a Berkshire Hackaway company, acquired CrowdSupply. Avnet acquired Hackster.io and Dragon Innovation. Newark is Element 14, and Avnet acquired Farnell, Newark, CPC, Element 14. Autodesk acquired Instructables, Upchain, and Eagle, and Tinkercad. Siemens acquired Avatar, which is uh, a little while ago, Supply Frame, Hackaday, and Tindy, and also Mentor Graphics back in 2016. Yeah. Um, back in 2016, also, Atmel was acquired by Microchip and Microsemi in 2019. Legup was also acquired by Microchip. Do we have the dialogue Broadcom merger? That was in there. Well, that, yeah, this um, Cypress Semi, I think. Yeah, there's a couple Cypress more. Cypress Semi bought some of Broadcom. There's a couple more I'm going to put in here. Yeah, God. It's a, it's, yeah. I mean, not even including the TI bought Linear. Yeah, right? there, Which there's is, some that are in the, the smaller space mm. that people are familiar with. And then, like, you know, I would say, yeah. you know, Haxor is a little bit different than. You know, Atmel. No, I know. Um, but you're saying like STM is just in Yeah. Nordic, so yeah. Nvidia in late 2020 announced they're going to try to buy ARM from SoftBank for 40 billion, but looks like that stalled. We'll see how that goes. Back in 2017, ARM had some involvement with Arduino, and it's a little unclear exactly if it was an investment or not. The people that are on the that were on the board from ARM said it was, um, but Arduino said it wasn't. So I just linked to that. STM Microelectronics is rumored to have an interest in Nordic Semiconductor. That just came out. Uh, that doesn't surprise May. me because Nordic is just totally wrecking ST on, on yeah. wireless. I mean, Nordic just does such a good job. Then, um, Arrow acquired United Technical Publishing, a division of Hearst Business Media back in 2015. It was unclear to me all the different media properties that were owned, but it's because Aspen Core is owned by um, Arrow, and Arrow has now things like EDN, Embedded.com, TechOnline, Datasheets.com, and that's part of Aspen Core, which is owned by um, Arrow. And then today, because folks probably have seen the news, Stack Overflow was bought for one billion. So there is this consolidation. So I'll probably add a couple of the other chip mm. companies. Um, but basically, um, I think it's just Adafruit and Spark Fund that's not owned by a beer company at this point. So oh. I have my questions over uh, to them, um, and we'll see. I, I did have very specific questions for Hackaday, and if they don't answer them, they can't. Um, I'll publish them later and just say, here's the questions I sent over. But I did close my questions with, hey, like, you know, Hackaday was important uh, to me personally because you know, I started it. And Supply Frame has done a good job taking care of it, and I hope Siemens does that as well and takes good care of the community. Okay, help wanted. This week's job on jobs.adafruit.com is from Headspin. They're looking for a hard, hardware engineer. And we got this. I, yeah, and I looked up what uh, they do. They have these really neat uh, standalone appliances for testing, looks like, huge amounts of mobile devices. Hmm. So check it out. Go to jobs.adafruit.com and check out the job for Headspin. They are located in Toronto, Canada. Just check and see if it's a uh, remote only or a, uh, in person only. Okay. Okay. Blinka, 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 blinka. Blinka time, blinka time. It's time for Blinka. There's so yeah. much going on in CircuitPython this week. There's too much going on in the world of Python and hardware. <laughs> you don't even do much. There's so or much. Or not enough. Yeah, so I'm going to get to this Gartner thing in a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, please do check out the latest newsletter. Go to adafruitdaily.com. We don't spam. We don't do anything like that. It's a completely separate site. And you'll be able to check out all the different things. So um, there's... Uh, 
new boards, uh, including the Micromod, I believe, is in there um, for the RP2040. Oh, for RP... Oh, we do, yeah, we've yeah. done a whole bunch of updates. Yeah. We added, like, six different boards. Lots of boards, lots yeah. of corrections on boards. ESP32 um, has two boards, RP2040 boards. Consistent board, uh, board LED mm -hmm. to most boards Yay. and a timing fix. So check that out. Um, also, worth noting, is uh, the Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect now supports CircuitPython. Thanks to Liz for doing the That's PR. Um, if you want to look at where uh, Python is, now, in addition to the regular old Python on hardware news, we have mm. kind of bigger picture Python. Well, I mean, it's, news, it's, it's, it's part of a community. Python, yeah. Yeah. So um, check that out. Python is swapping positions with Java for now the second most popular language. It's kind of cool. Um, so if you're thinking about what programming language to use, look at some of the trends. Uh, later on, I'll have more information about our uh, TI interview that I think we're going to be able to do. Uh, TI is using a fork of CircuitPython, and uh, I got a hold of them, and they're going to send the questions I sent over, and I'm going to ask, okay, why did you choose Python in general, by the way, but also, you know, why do you have this cool fork of CircuitPython you're putting on your calculators? A um, little bit of a recap from the deep dive with Scott, the CircuitPython Parsec with JP, um, some of the guides and more that we've had here, and then tons and tons and tons and tons of USB related stuff. Uh, Keyboards and encoders and LEDs stuff. and buttons yeah. and circuit python. People are all, all the they're really getting into it. There's so much good example. MIDI controllers. Code. Yeah. So um, do check it out. It's at the point where there's so much news that I now pick one important thing okay. per newsletter to go yeah, over. Yeah, there's too much. Because there's too You're much. Right, there's too much. There I, is yeah. And that's a good sign. It's it's almost um, Okay, so what's the thing? Okay, so the thing this week is so Gartner has always been a big deal. If something's in the Gartner report, like it's like okay, this is a this is this is it, and this is their hype cycle for embedded software systems, 2020. Now this is just came out not too long ago, and if you go to the Arduino site because I got this through the newsletter, you just sign up, you put your information in, and then they give you access to the report. Um, there's a couple pieces that I thought was really neat. So previously, Python on hardware wasn't really there. In fact, it was in a different location. So um, they give them terms in here. So the trough of disillusionment um, is where Arduino, IoT, Edge Architecture, 1M2M, and then you could see where the slope of enlightenment is, and that's it where... It actually is getting used by people. It's not it, only... Like people who can use yeah. it are using it. So not only is it getting used, but if you, if you read the little summary that's in the newsletter and also on our site, Using Python I like how, on like, hardware. like Sensor Fusion is like on the slope. We've been using Sensor Fusion for 20 years. It's in everything, folks. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about so this. So the the interesting thing, MicroPython, CircuitPython, Python, and uh, we're we're named in this report, is it's so fast to do development that you now see it in this area of like if you want to do Bluetooth, low cost development, do prototyping really fast. It's now taking off faster than some of the previous solutions, even like mm -hmm. Arduino, which is also a very fast way to, to prototype and more. Yeah. So it's one to watch, and when like, kind of like. I mean, it's cool that it's even in this. I mean, like people are paying attention it's, to it. Yeah, it's like what's you know on Twitter you see people snark on each other like, oh, the normies know about this now. You know, it's like when someone says, oh, they're you know, I like that band before everyone liked them. Well, this is kind of like that. So as soon as it starts getting these syndicate research reports, that means it really, really, really is getting an industry a lot. And that's what we're seeing. But it's nice to see this report. So check it out. Links to all that and more in the Python Hardware Newsletter. Sweet. Thank you, Blinka. I read the newsletter top to bottom every week it comes out. All right. Open Great source newsletter. hardware. We are an open source hardware company. We have 2,485 guides. Lady yes. Ada, what's on the big board this week? All right. So, so we got some new guides. New guides are the Rotary Trinket Guide that Katni wrote up. Thank you. We also got from Dylan a project to uh, keep track of your plants using CircuitPython and I think uh, either Raspberry Pi Pico or an RP2040 Feather and uh, Airlift Featherwing, and it'll send you a Discord or Slack message when your plant needs watering. Now, obviously, you can always still look at your plant, but it's a really good project to demonstrate how to automate sending things to third-party platforms like Discord and Slack. Um, we've got the Funhouse Parking Assistant. This is a really common project people like to build with electronics. Using a uh, ultrasonic sensor in the Funhouse and CircuitPython, you can light up a gigantic strip of LEDs or the onboard LEDs on the Funhouse to let you know when you're about to hit a pole. Um, so it uses the ultrasonic to tell you when the distance is, is less than a certain amount. And the ultrasonic sensors are like perfect for this project because they're good up to about three meters. Um, and then we got a couple updated guides, the Pygamer Thermal Camera and Library Guide. Uh, Jen's gonna actually probably update that guide. I added effect to the Neotrellis Guide. 
Uh, Melissa updated the tutorial for the e-ink event calendar because Google <laughs> changed their interface. And then from last week, we've got Carter's guide for using U2IF with RP2040, and Katni wrote the Neo Key Trinky guide. Yeah. I want to say that uh, Eric has a very good uh, headline that I feel like I've now missed out on. You know what? Circuit Python slithers its way up the slope of enlightenment. Man, I can't believe I missed oh, that man. one. Oh, no. That's okay. All right. You can't get every, you know, Hindsight that's a really totally good headline. Yeah. All right. So, anywho, uh, moving right along. Um, we have our factory footage right here from Adafruit and more. Take it away. Hey, factory away. Adafruit factory. And uh, I set up my Radio Shack sign. So there's, <laughs> there's a rumor we bought Radio Shack because we had, well, someone gifted us. But these, we did yeah. get a Radio Shack sign. I bought a Radio Shack sign. sign. So this is on the back of my desk. Um, it just says Hack R right now. And I'm going to do a post because I think Radio Shack should rebrand as Hack. Hacker. And uh, you would buy gaming stuff, keyboards, all the things that a lot of people are doing. And this would be a neat way to revitalize that brand, I think. But anywho, um, other factory footage wouldn't be complete without a time lapse from Disney across the street. They have this big flag um, oh, that's yeah. been added over there. And uh, remember when I was talking about rainbows, this was right outside our window here in Adafruit. Oh no, I Double missed rainbow. it. Double rainbow. When was this? Empire State Building. Uh, I believe it was on Friday when it was raining. Oh, I think cool. So. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. So that's why we, of course, have the code in rainbows. Yeah. Because there's all sorts of things going on. All right. 10% off rainbows. All right, 3D printing with no page. We got two things: we got the Trinky case, and then we got a giant MX switch. So we're going to play those back to back, and we shall see you on the other side. Hey, what's up, folks? In this video, we're checking out the Neo Trinky. This features a SAMD21 with four NeoPixels and two capacitive touchpads fitted into a USB key that can run CircuitPython or Arduino. We designed and 3D printed a case with a large keyring and used translucent filament to diffuse the NeoPixels. In this demo, we're using the Neo Trinky as a remote shutter button for a mobile camera phone using the HID library for CircuitPython. It can also work as a media controller for your computer or laptop. You can use the cap touch pads to adjust the volume in the NeoPixels for visual feedback. You can 3D print a USB shell for the USB Trinky boards to give them a tighter fitting. It features a thin wall that wedges into the USB port, giving it a secured connection. It's a quick 3D print that doesn't require any support material, so you can make one for each of your USB Trinkies. 
using conductive PLA filament, you can create capacitive touch pads with custom shapes that can wrap around, making it easier to touch. To install CircuitPython, we'll go to circuitpython.org and search for the Neo Trinky. You'll want to select your preferred language from the drop down and click the download button. Double press the reset button on the board to get into the bootloader mode. You'll know it's ready to install when the NeoPixels turn green. Then just drag and drop the UF2 file onto the USB drive. You can get the files to print your own case from the Learn Guide. Start by inserting the Neo Trinky into the case and fitting the pin from the cover through the slot. The two are snap fitted together. Use conductive PLA filament for the button add-ons and press fit them over the touch pads. The case features a large ring so you can easily remove it from any USB port or USB hub. We found translucent natural PLA worked the best for diffusing the NeoPixels. The cover has a built-in button actuator for the reset switch so you can still access it when you need to. So if you're just getting started with programming and electronics, we hope you're inspired to check out the Adafruit NeoTrinky and CircuitPython. you like switches so I made you a switch to store your switches. I just in. love it. It's like you have a gigantic thing that you put the small version of That's the right. thing into. So if you want to learn how to make all the stuff from more 3D handouts with no pager every single Wednesday. Next up. Okay. Hi, This week's Ion NPI brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit is from Raspberry Pi. It's and juicy. Is the RB2040. It's, it's delicious, yes, finally. We've actually been waiting for this to drop and we've been anticipating the RP2040 on I on MPI from Raspberry Pi. It's their yes. first microcontroller chip and we've we featured Maxim and ST and Analog and, and Atmel and Microchip and all those people and, and they're wonderful, we love them. But we also want to give some love to Raspberry Pi because they have finally released the chip that is in the Pico and so many uh, develop, development boards that we you call the RP2040 development board series, you can now get that chip so you, the viewer, can make your own RP2040 boards. So uh, this is what it looks like. It's called the RP2040. And um, this is the same chip. Right now there's only one chip. Um, and it's the same chip that you can find in the Raspberry Pi Pico. So you can see it in the center there. I mean, I think, Part of me believes that like half of the reason they made this chip is just because they wanted to see their logo etched on a microcontroller. Because like that's freaking. Wouldn't that be cool to have like an Adafruit logo on a microcontroller? Yeah. Know, maybe one day. One day. All right. Uh, it's also in our Feather RP2040, which by the way we open sourced the design. So if you're looking for like a core that you can use, that's like a you know the Raspberry Pi Foundation actually looked at it and they kind of like fix all the little mistakes I had. So if you want like a design that's ready to go, that you can uh, copy the schematic or layout even for a known working RP2040 design, check out the Feather RP2040. And of course you can fit on very small boards like the uh, QDPi 2040 uh, here as well. And best of all, it's $1, which is a great deal. It's a good price for a microcontroller as powerful as this one. So it's a, a dual Cortex M0 and it's running really fast. It's uh, 130 megahertz. It's got a ton of RAM, but it doesn't have any flash. We'll talk about it in a little minute. Um, one thing to note, and just because you know people who are wanting to use this in their designs, this is a 0.4 millimeter pitch QFN56, I think. It's I haven't had a lot of problems with bridging, but it is a fine pitch chip. So definitely, this is not an easy hand solderable chip. You, you kind of can hand solder, especially with some hot air and some flux and some paste. Really, you know, you definitely need to have a, a custom PC before it. So it's something to watch out for. Um, this isn't a dip chip or even like a large SYC that you can like use as your first microcontroller. 
hopefully eventually they'll design a version that has bigger pads maybe or you know it's fewer pins and larger pads but at this time right now it's only available in one package the qfn 56 with 0.4 millimeter pitch spacing um the name is uh designates what's inside of it which i think is interesting because it sort of implies that there might be other configurations so the two is a number of cores remember it's a dual core the zero is the m0 core which is you know it's a it's a very popular arm cortex 32-bit core uh we've seen it in the samd 21 of course stm 32f uh 1x series is the cortex m0 um, Nordic makes a bunch of to the NRF 51 series is a Cortex M0. Cortex M0 is very, very popular. It's a very easy uh, to use chip. ARM GCC has great support for it. It doesn't have DSP or floating point support. If that's something you need, they do have some helper functions in the ROM for floating points. So it's not like as slow as doing it in pure software. However, it, it just doesn't have SIMD. It doesn't have, you know, floating points. It doesn't have DSP. If that's important to you, and it's not good enough to do it in software, this chip isn't for you. Um, next up is the RAM. So this is where it's interesting. So there's a ton of RAM. This has a 264K of RAM, which is a lot of RAM for a Cortex M0. Usually these kinds of chips have like 16K, maybe 32K. This has a ton, which is great. If, if you need to like buffer, you know, a camera or a, a full display or a TFT or whatever, you need a lot of RAM, this chip has got you and it's all contiguous as well. And then finally, how much flash is in it? And like I said, these have zero flash on board, which means you're going to have to add another uh, chip externally to add flash. Um, here's all the things uh, built in. So uh, you the, the dual cortex, the SRAM, the multifunction GPIO. I'll show you the, the pin map. Uh, six pins are required for the execute in place external flash memory. Um, there's built-in hardware for the most peripherals you're used to, and there's four ADCs, and not a lot of ADCs. It's the only thing that's kind of like a little anemic compared to some chips, but of course you can always connect an SPI or I2C um, expander, and it is 12-bit, so you get good quality. And of course, uh, team USB support with host and device. Um, for the peripherals, so this is kind of a repeated, there's DMA and all that good stuff and PLLs. Um, the peripherals, there's two hardware UARTs, two hardware SPIs, two hardware I2Cs, 16 PWM channels, and they're split across all of the GPIO. Now, one thing you might notice is like, well, where's the I2S? Where's the PDM? Where's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's usually in the peripheral, like rotary encoder management, um, maybe motor timing control, whatever, IRDA support. All that would actually be handled by the PIO state machine. I'm not going to get the whole thing, but basically it's a pro mini programmable state machine that you can use to make complicated bit bang uh, patterns. So you could do stuff like, BitBang DVI or BitBang Ethernet, but you're not actually BitBanging it because you have this tool that's doing it for you. It's great for NeoPixels, for example, because NeoPixels are a very simple protocol, but you have to get the timing perfect. Um, they're great at simple patterns of data that just have to have perfect timing. Um, and this is the internal structure. Uh, you can DMA everything back and forth. It's kind of, kind of a standard uh, Cortex M0 um, structure. There's a little bit of on, uh, on chip cache for the execute in place because again flash memory is on an external chip that's um, accessed via QSPY. These are all the GPIO. I'm not going to go into all the GPIO and what they all do. Of course, there's a debug port, there's crystal. Um, every pin can be UART, SPI, or I2C, but it's not fully crossbarred. It just means like every other pin is a UART RX, every other pin is an I2C, SDA, SCL. You're not going to have like complete free control to assign anything to anything but you're always gonna be able to, there's like five options for every pin. So you always have some configuration that's gonna work out for what you wanna do. For external memory, just factor that into your cost. You know, you're gonna to have to have any size you want, but I like this eight megabit uh, QSPY um, flash from GigaDevice. I like this chip, but you know, Winbond makes chips, Adesto makes chips, tons of people make chips. It is required, you, you really can't use this chip without having external flash memory and also an external 12 megahertz crystal. Um, for firmware, there's a lot of options. There's MicroPython, there's Pico SDK, there's lots of examples in C, there's um, CircuitPython, there's Arduino. Um, so to start, don't forget, we have CircuitPython support. People are adding their boards. Uh, you can go into the boards directory under ports Raspberry Pi. 
Honestly, copy and paste something that exists and fill out your pin structure and how much flash memory you've got. And it'll probably just work. Uh, we've got for Arduino, there's two ports available. Um, I actually kind of like the, this Philhauer port. It's got a lot of functionality and it works very solidly and it's, it's a low level Pico SDK. So it's, you can still use all the Pico SDK stuff that you know and love um, inside the Arduino core. Uh, so check out uh, this for Arduino support. It's beta, but I've been using it with success. Uh, and of course, Arduino, like very recently, also released um, RP2040 support using Embed as an underlying core. Um, I've used it a little bit, but not as much. Uh, however, uh, it's exciting, and they said that they would be willing to take pull requests as well for boards. So very exciting to have two possibilities there. That's available on DigiGate. That's right. You can pick it up for one dollar. That's it's right. one dollar. Yeah, cue that. I'll buy that for a dollar from Robocop. I'll buy that for a dollar. And then you uh, sent me a little bit of a video. I was going to play a clip. Okay, on so that. this video, it's because you can be in, read all about the RP2040, but this video shows the capabilities of PIO to do um, like decoding of data, driving an, an HDMI display natively. Like there's no encoder in between. You just connect the pins directly to the HDMI cable and it can, or DVI cable, and it can actually. Uh, or VGA cable with some resistors, and you can mimic a BBC microcomputer, which is amazing for a dual core Cortex M0. I think they overclock it a little bit, but not that much. Um, there's a lot of performance and capability you can squeeze out of this by using the PIO. So I just thought this was a cool, cool demo. So short URL there, product ID there, get it on DigiKey and all Yeah, the they're selling in reels of 500 or 3,400. There's two reel sizes, seven inch and 13 inch. They're currently out of stock because everyone has them out of stock. However, sign up and you'll be notified. Uh, I know that the Pi Foundation is, is pushing more into inventory as much as possible. So sign up, you'll be notified and then you can uh, use our designs as your base, design your own RP2040 board. Let's say on MPI. Hi, on MPI. Okay, so before we do new products, which we'll start in a few seconds, don't forget to load up your cart and get ready. In rainbows is the discount code. 10% off. 10% off. Get that discount. All right, so uh, first up, coming soon, I'll take care of this one. Uh, CircuitPython 7 is on its way. It's the great merge with MicroPython and CircuitPython and Look, keyboards. Look, your best friends. And keyboards. Lots of keyboard, HID, so USB stuff, it's that's, happening. That's it. For This is a poster, sign up, we'll be making a few, um, and uh, you can always download it as well. Okay. Next up. All right, uh, we've got some updates. So this is the three and five millimeter uh, infrared brake beam sensors. You have one transmitter at the top, and then on the bottom is the receiver, uh, a transistor receiver. Uh, these are great for brake beams. You want to see if somebody has, like, put their hand or something or some devices between the two LEDs. They work about like a foot or two away. Um, three millimeter and five millimeter. So the update is uh, they now come with these nice premium wire ends. So you can, you can solder them if you want, but they're great for breadboards now. Before they were bare wires. Now we spent a little bit more, got them with premium wires. We had this in our um, Ada box, the last one we just shipped. And I love them so much. I was like, I want them for the store as well. So we've updated this product. Yeah, and then there's the other one. Uh, this is the five millimeter, same deal, yeah. more LED, more bright, premium. Okay, next up. All right, next up, we've got a whole plethora, like a, really a menagerie of um, 2.54 mil, millimeter or 0 0.1 inch pitch uh, jumper cables. So these are like kind of standard, like Berg or Molex, whatever you want to call them, jumper cables that have two sockets on either end, and yeah, so I'll so show. I'll show. I, there's so I many. I started off with one, and then it was like, oh no, we're just gonna we're just gonna show all of them. Yeah, there's because just a lot. there's too many to show. Okay. One after the other after the other. So, so yeah, I'm gonna show them all at once. Yeah. So so basically, 
We have, um, you know, and we have individual like jumper jerky, like the pullable ones, but these are in one piece. And there are a lot of times where I'm like, I really do want them to be in one solid piece so I can jumper two things together. Um, you don't have to worry about like accidentally flipping one or coming loose. So we have them, you know, in like up to, I think, 20 in a row. We have like eight, 12, 16, five. We've actually already carried six. Oh, one thing I'll note is uh, there's no guarantee of the colors um, because they're just like jumpers that you'll, they'll definitely be like, you know, symmetric. So yellow, like pin one is pin one and then pin five is pin five, right? They're, they're going to be in order, but the colors may vary. Although I've, I've noticed that once you get to the longer ones, you know, they tend to start with, with black and then white and then back to brown. Um, that said, you now have, a, you know, these about eight inches long in all sorts of lengths. They're just really handy. Um, and they make for very clean wiring. And because they're 0.1 inch, they work with just about anything, like everything you, that would normally use a breadboard or headers, um, you can now easily jumper them. And of course, we also have the individual jumpers. But what I like about these is that you don't have to worry about these coming apart or coming loose. They're just like one solid strip. So I think these are very handy. Okay, next up. Okay, luxury key puller. This is like the wire whisk style. This is the nice kind of wire key puller. So if you're doing keyboard stuff and you have to pull keycaps off, um, this is actually kind of a tool to use. Like really, this is the only thing that works really well. Like with your fingernails, you're just gonna break them. This has like these two strong metal prong kind of whiskey looking things and they slide over the keycap as you saw in the image and then they can just pull it right off. They work really great. Um, they're not as cheap as the plastic finger ring ones, but those don't work very well. These can get in even if it's like in the middle of the keyboard. You can pull out individual keys anywhere on the keyboard, yeah. which makes them, I think, a wonderful tool. All right, next up, this is an update. Also an update, but leading into another product, uh, for this magnetic uh, read sensor that's built in. It's a door sensor, a window sensor. You all see these in security systems. Um, these also now have premium wire ends on them, so they're easier to use with a breadboard or perf board or plugging them into cables or whatever. I, I just love these and we did it for the AdaBox and now they're in the store. Speaking of, if you missed out on this last AdaBox because we sold out, we basically have a starter kit that has everything that was in the box except for the year subscription to Adafruit IO, which was of course only for subscribers. Um, but this pack has all the sensors that you need to follow along with all the AdaBox projects. So you can do um, the mail slot detector, as shown here, using brake beam. Um, we've got, uh, this, this is, is the a door, door alert sensor that sends you an email when a door has been opened using, as you can see, the, the magnetic door sensor. We've got the um, parking detector. Melissa did a bunch of home assistant projects. There was that uh, water cat bull sensor to see if your cat needs more water. Um, so you've got the water sensor, the window or door magnetic sensor, the ultrasonic sensor, the PIR sensor, so you can detect a person, uh, the brake beam sensor, cables, the back plate, and uh, the yellow brick mounting stand. Next up. All right, next up, uh, you get these skinny NeoPixel strips that are RGBW. Uh, we have RGBW LED strips, but they're kind of chunky. These are very slim, and so I thought these could be handy for some people. And they're beautiful. So inside each... Um, NeoPixel, it's not just RGB, you can see kind of the, it's split in half. The top half has RGB and then the bottom half has yellow and it's separated. So if you want to have like true white color phosphor LED light, you're going to get that with the sensor, whereas normally if you try to mix RGB, it never quite comes out white. It's like white's kind of funky, you really want like this full spectrum color. So we've got these in two versions. One is the warm white as shown here yeah. and then this one, which has the same RGB, and then when it goes to the white, it's a cool white. So two versions, warm white and cool white. We just kind of skip neutral. And then I can, um, I can show real fast on the overhead as well. So as normal, uh, each one comes with a JST um, SM connector, three pins with data, power, and ground. And then uh, you can see it does the rainbow, it's very good at the rainbow, red, green, blue, and then a warm white. And it's a really nice white color. So for architectural or accenting lighting, where you want it to be a, a true, like incandescent white or a daylight white, um, this is going to look much, much, much better than trying to color mix the RGB segments. 
just remember you need to have a NeoPixel library that has RGBW support. Almost all of them do, but just make sure you follow that step because it has four LEDs in it, not three, otherwise your data will come up all funky. All right. And then we have the star that shows tonight besides you, Lady Ada, our community, and our team here at Adafruit. It's the RP2040. They come in one and ten. That's right. Coming soon. Uh, we also don't have any spares right now. As seen on. Yeah, because we're uh, using them for these things. On the Feather, RP2040. On the Cutie yeah. Pie. Uh, on the Itsy Bitsy. On the Cube 2040 I'm designing. Um, this chip, I've been using it. It's been great. I love it. And uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, um, as of Monday, is sort of letting people sell them individually. Um, so right now, sign up, and we'll have them in singles or packs of 10. Uh, as of right now, the price is, again, a dollar a piece. It's a great price. Um, and then, of course, use our open source design to kickstart your design. And then you can make your own. Make your own whatever you want. It's, it's, a great, it's a great price for a chip so powerful. Dual Cortex M0 with tons of RAM. Uh, runs MicroPython, runs CircuitPython, runs Arduino, runs Embed. Um, you know, anything that needs a lot of RAM needs fast BitBang um, IO support using the PIO clusters that are into this chip. Um, I love it for CircuitPython because it, there's so much RAM and CircuitPython requires a lot of RAM. But I've just been having fun with it um, using teeny USB to make um, me mechanical keyboards that are reprogrammable. Yeah. The RP2040, of course, does an excellent, excellent job at it. So uh, check out the RP2040. Um, it's going to be in the shop soon. You can sign up. And then don't forget, you'll also need uh, SPI flash with it, which we also stock. Yep. Got it. Okay, well, um, you can use this code on checkout and get 10% 10 10 off, off that like key puller. Yeah. It's a pretty sweet key puller. Okay, we're going to answer some questions over in Discord. I got like a couple mm -hmm. loaded up, uh, adafruit.it slash Discord. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do some top secret. Okay. Let's get out of the vault. What's yeah. in the vault this week? So from the vault this week, um, you you previewed this. Oh, I sent out this panel. It do showed up. Do you want to talk about any of this? Well, I've got the, the Keeb RP2040 in the top right. So that's my, like, it's an RP2040 board that's for mechanical keyboards. And I put some things in it, I think, to make it especially friendly for mechanical keyboards. Um, it's got, uh, I got the e-ink trinky, which uses kind of suggestions. I was like, that's a good idea. Um, I've got the new Stemma friend with RP2040, and then you can see there's two, there's the, 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 the macro pad I've been working on for a couple weeks now, and then um, the key plate and the bottom plate. So there's two P3s that have no traces because they're just like mechanical. And then I think I have some like GPIO breakout thing. Okay, and then here is a preview. This is a mock-up that's not real yet of Glider. It's the way that we hope you could transfer files, any type of file, from device to device, and this will work with PyLeap, which is an editor for mobile devices for CircuitPython. So this is what Trevor's been working on. Antonio's working on the uh, pieces with Scott and Trevor. No, this is a team and, effort. I'm loving it. Everyone's and, everyone's like yeah. getting together. Yeah. So uh, we were talking about this in our other meeting. Um, so this isn't you know an app. It's a mock-up of it, and yes. it's not real yet. But this is probably what it's going to be. But just you know, yeah, get, seeing, get get the feeling for it. Yeah. Okay, and that's uh, top secret for this week. Get back in the vault. More hardware to come. Okay, so we're gonna go to questions. They're over. This here. is also a good nose puller. And the questions. Uh, okay, so uh, let me go to this first one, which was. Uh, how many product ideas have you had, and how many have made it in development, and how many have actually become products? I think about half of the ideas I have actually make it to products. But if I've if I've developed it, there's a 95% chance it'll make it into the store. Yeah. Only very rarely do things get designed and then don't make it, and usually it's for some tactical reason or like it's in. It, I didn't feel good about releasing it because it wasn't reliable enough. But most do. Do these um, strands work with the uh, Funhouse? Um, the, the plugs that go in? No, it's a different plug. I mean, you can use the plugs that are on the Funhouse, and then just you just put little wires in between them to match them up. OK. Um, question for the show. You had featured um, the Nina West uh, Blues Clues video. Uh, just curious if you previously followed Nina or your, your recent dis or a new discovery. Well, from RuPaul's show, I think where that's everyone knows Nina West from, at least. A lot of us do. Oh, um, cool. But uh, there's a really cool video with Blue's Clues. Uh, check it out on our blog. And I think uh, a lot of folks are talking about it right now. 
Question for Ask an Engineer. I'm wondering if there are ways to execute code that would somehow be embedded in JSON format. I like the simplicity of JSON, but it seems only to be real for use for storing variables. I like the idea of being able to remotely update code that would be embedded in JSON. I'm wondering if there's something like, that, like that's been already been done. I'll try to give it a shot, but I'd like to know before trying to reinvent the wheel. Thanks, you. I appreciate you all. Um, in Python, you can you can just yes. send over. I mean, it's a, it's. I mean, it's not with, terrible. With just, glider and Py, PyLeap, you no, might be no, able to. No, no. I mean, it's just in Python yeah. in general. Like, if you if you send over a text file, you can evaluate that text file or import that text file, and it will run. Like that's interpreted languages can do that. Uninter non interpreted languages, you're going to have a much much bigger challenge. Um, you can do some hacks, but really, this is where interpreted languages. Um, work out. The only thing is that, of course, then you have to worry about code protection, right? Because it's like, if you're going to execute anything that somebody sends over, you want to make sure that it's it's trustworthy code that yeah. you're executing. What sort of Python library should I use for Funhouse display? Um, well, we have a, a library for the Funhouse um, that handles all of it, but the chip itself is a ST7789, so any ST7789 TFT driver will be able to display it. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Trevor's works make me, makes me want to get an iOS device. I will try to remember to send this to Trevor. That's high praise. He should get a commission from Apple. Um, I do iOS work. I feel like I probably make it. Uh, I could do it easier than when I tried before. Uh, next up, uh, why are the analog ports on Funhouse five volts? Well, there you can change the power to be three volts. The reason they're five volts is because a lot of times you want to connect to. Um, like NeoPixels or a servo or something that really does need five volts, um, the input pin is voltage protected, so you can have inputs that are like, if they go up to five, they'll just get cut off at 3.3. We found that this is like a good in-between state where it's like people want to drive things that need a significant amount of power and you don't want to overload the 3.3 volt regulator, but you can always cut the trace and solder the 3.3 volt jumper if you need to. All right. I have a project using the Funhouse that downloads an album out from, you, from YouTube for current playing music. I have lost my code in all my libraries a few times because the Funhouse has to be in read-only mode to download the images. Is there a way to do this uh, in memory using Bytes.io versus file object? Okay, there's, there's an album for YouTube for current playing music. I have lost my code in my library. Okay, first off, back up your code. Um, it has to be in read-write mode to download the images. Um... If the image is small enough, I mean, so the Funhouse has a ton of PS RAM. If the image is small enough, you can you can store the bitmap in memory, and then maybe you could use that to display it. I agree. It's not like the the way our display is designed is um, you don't. It's not like Arduino where you can like blit to it. Um, but I think I think your best bet is to load it like a sprite in in memory, and then try to display it as like a, a palleted image and see how far you get with that. But yeah, it's going to be tough because there's, the Funhouse doesn't have external storage for it. Um, and I don't think we have like the ability, we don't have the ability to do a RAM disk or anything. So yeah, I think that's kind of, that's kind of the only thing I can think of for you to do. Or just be really careful. Don't um, use one of the switches to detect whether it's in read mode or write mode and only allow one or the other, right? So if, if the button is pressed, when it boots up, you can write to the disk, but the computer, the CircuitPython can't. And when you don't have it, then CircuitPython can and you can't. So like, get rid of the like two things are possibly writing to the file system at the same time, which is what is corrupting your file system. Okay, next up. Uh, any higher amperage power supply uh, that runs on lithium ions? Um, well, we've got the PowerBoost 1000, if that's what you're talking about, and they'll give you up to two amps or so. All right. Someone wants to dig around, play, and build stuff in the warehouse room you're in. Yeah, um, do some tutorials online, apply for a job later, and uh, the folks who work here get free stuff. So that's uh, one of the perks. I always forget to mention it because I always assume that folks know it, but when we have new people who start them, like, oh, by the way, don't forget, like, you get free stuff. Free stuff. Um, next up, which one has had a SD card? Yeah, maybe we'll have another version. There was of no. It. Um, there's no yeah. flash. Sorry, there's no pins left for. I said, believe me, the original version had an SD card, and if you look, every single pin is taken, and so there was no there was no spot for an SD card, and so that was like the the sacrifice yeah. that we made. All about constraints. Um, the Gartner report got a shout out. You know, sometimes these reports are a little boring, um, but now they're getting exciting. So this one got a shout out. The slope of an enlightenment. Circuit it's Python slithers, way up. slithers its way up the slope of enlightenment. All right, let's see if we have any other questions. 
I think uh, that is it. Some folks are helping each other out, try to find an online API that could take the LMR to URL and create a small bitmap. Might be easier to keep memory. Yeah, I know. There's it's on the the Pi portal. We we use the external SD card. I think I think your best bet is actually just to uh, to use one of the buttons to avoid corrupting the file system. I think that because yeah. it it'll work fine as long as you are not writing the file system while it's writing the file system. All right. And I think that is it. Some shout outs for the Blues Clues video that we had on there. Okay. Uh, I've got an image. Okay, that's a follow up. Folks are helping each other. Thanks for helping each other out. Yeah, for those working, no, this is not, not oh, everything is designed. For those working at the Adafruit headquarters, what are the hours and schedule like? Well, I'm one of the people who works here. Uh, I, I work here too. I uh, clock in and clock out, just like uh, most folks here. So depending on. You're in the clock right now? Yes. Uh, depending on which department you're in, so our receiving department's a little bit early, earlier, um, but we do eight-hour shifts. Um, we also make sure people get paid lunch breaks, paid breaks, all that stuff. You don't have to time clock in and time clock out for that stuff. Um, lots of paid time off. Uh, we have break areas, and the schedules uh, that a lot of folks keep are up to them, which is one of the things that we really like is having flexible schedules. So there's folks who uh, maybe they have kids or maybe they have other stuff going on. Um, some folks are here as early as seven and they would probably leave by three. And then folks are 11 to seven. Uh, usually there is, uh, in some departments, for instance, shipping, uh, I do a stand-up meeting with our team. Um, we call it the stretch. It mostly turns into Star Trek trivia and of the day. In fact, the last one we talked about, Snorks. Um, snorks. Yeah. And, uh, it's, Probably didn't think you were going to talk about snorks Yeah, today. it's one of those things where we, uh, for people's schedules, uh, we really like to empower people. Like, if we can get the work done, let's figure out schedules that work for everyone. We don't really want to do weekends anymore, um, but if, if we need to, some people uh, do weekend schedules, and we don't do anything overnight or at night. Um, turns out a lot of folks like to come in, do a great job, and then leave and miss it and want to come back the next day. So with that, I think uh, is... Oh, can people post tutorials uh, on Instructable, like Instructables, on the Learn Guide section? No, we usually curate because we have a lot of code that we're responsible for. But if someone writes a really good guide, we usually suggest post to put on, on Hackster, Hackster or Instructables, Instructables, and then let us know. Hack and, and then we do have guide writers that we usually like to see some guides they've written before. Because there's so many places for user that. guides that we 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 think it's good for them. You know, like that's that's covered. There's a lot of places, so yeah. um, post your projects there, and we'll we'll blog them. All right. Uh, do you let people work 100 hours if they want? No. No, not really. Um, in fact, so employers usually try to get away with not paying people overtime. We would love to pay people overtime if they want to, but we also know the live-work balance is way more important. So we really want people to uh, you know, do 40-ish hours, um, and please be here for the long term. We have a lot of folks that have been with us you know, seven, eight years. That's basically the length of time Adafruit's been around, and we enjoy that because they don't get burnt out. So I think that was the last question. Okay, thanks everybody. I think I got to all of them. All right, Good thanks work, Lady to Anna. Uh, Good work, everyone. That is it for this week. Don't forget the code is in rainbows. Look at these rainbow LEDs. We got all sorts of rainbows from Adabox rainbows. Rainbow. To Happy Pride Month rainbows. Rainbow. To double rainbows. Double rainbow. To all the rainbows on all of the wires. Like I said, rainbows. lots of rainbows this week. We'll see everybody next week. Rainbows. Thanks so much to Car, who's running Slack behind rainbows. the scenes. Thank you all of our teams that are out there and community and customers that have been keeping us going. We'll Thanks, see everybody. everybody next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Here is your moment of Zener. Rainbow.